Hi everybody, Brian Henderson here, showing you my latest project. Today I'm going to be showing you how to connect an airsoft gun to a remote control car. For those of you who saw my other YouTube video showing how to connect a Nerf machine gun to a remote control car, <laughs> sometimes when the toy you've always wanted doesn't exist, you have to make your own. It's the exact same process. It's really easy. You can do it in an afternoon, really just a couple hours. And what's really cool about this project is that you can get all the parts you need for it locally in your own hometown. You don't need to order anything online. You can if you want to, if you can find a deal. And of course, do that if you've got the time. But if you're looking to just have a good summer day afternoon project, this is the way to do it. First thing you'll need is a good airsoft gun. Um, a lot of places now have airsoft gun stores that sell just airsoft guns, or you can go to Walmart, uh, someplace like that, to buy these. Basically, it's a battery-powered uh, BB gun that shoots plastic pellets, and in this case, this is one that I got from a local airsoft shop for $35. Uh, you can see that I've chopped off the handle, uh, which held the battery originally, and also the trigger mechanism. I used just a coping saw. And I don't know what plastic this is made out of, but it cut through it like butter, pretty much. It was one of the easiest um, hacks I've ever done. Um, now, the trigger, basically what the trigger does on a battery-powered airsoft gun is that it um, makes a connection to the battery. So you can remove that trigger, me trigger mechanism and just bypass that completely. And I've got, you see, the red wire and the black wire. When you connect those to a battery, it makes the mechanism start firing. So that's... Um, that's the most important part there. We're going to be triggering that remotely. I'll show you that next. This is the battery that went for that gun. You can see how it looks like a magazine clip. It originally clipped in the handle. Obviously, since I cut off the handle, uh, then we won't be able to put this where it originally was. Uh, for this project, I found a little bit larger size battery at Radio Shack on clearance. It's a uh, 2,000 milliamp hours, uh, so a bit better capacity than what the original 400 milliamp hours on this battery is. So, so that will be important because I plan on playing with this a lot. Now the final part of the puzzle, right here I got this from Toys R Us today for $40. It's a New Bright brand remote control car. Uh, you can get these from Walmart as well. They have several different um, models, but it's the same uh, chassis underneath. Uh, for the Nerf gun hack, I used one that was a yellow Hummer. This one looks like it's a, a Dodge truck, but uh, it's the same bottom part. Now, what's interesting is this runs off of six volts, if you can see that. Um, you might have noticed the battery using is actually 7.2 volts, and so you might be saying, well, I don't want to fry it. Well, it, the motors in this can handle um, a bit higher voltage, I think up to... Uh, 9 volts easily, 12 volts is probably pushing it, um, but 7.2 volts would be just fine. The car will just go faster. It'll work the motors a little bit harder, but um, it'll be zippier. And because of the bigger capacity we're using, um, we're not even using the original battery, uh, it'll have extended battery life as well. So let me show you how to start taking this apart and uh, put it all together, and then we'll see it in action. Okay, so to take the top off of this RC car, there's only three screw posts right here, here, and here. And I've already undone those, so the top lifts off. And that leaves you with the basic platform underneath. And um, for any number of robotics projects or anything like that, just a cheap RC car like this is um, worth the money. It, it, it's really pretty easy to get into. And uh, we just have one last part right here covering up the circuit board inside. And just like that, so four screws and you're in. Pretty nice, huh? Sometimes working with cheap, electron cheap, uh, yeah, cheap electronics from China, uh, it, it's, it's kind of nice because of the simplicity of it all. Now, um, give you an idea of what this is all going to look like when we're all done. This is going to be kind of pretty silly. Uh, but a lot of fun. Okay. 
Okay, so when it comes to hacking remote control cars, sometimes cheaper is better. The main reason why is because the receiving and transmission chipset that's used for the radio control of the radio controlled car is oftentimes the very standard TX2 RX2 chipset. Uh, in the case of Newbright, they use their own brand of chips, but it follows the same architecture, so it's probably they just took that design and they make them in-house. actually says Newbright on the chip itself, but this right here, basically what you call the brains of the whole outfit. Um, now, I spoke in my last video with the Nerf gun talking about how there is oftentimes an unused channel for remote control cars. There's um, Basically, there's three channels. There's one that controls the forward and back, and then there's another that controls the left and right. But oftentimes, since this is a standard chip, there's an extra pin called turbo, uh, and that allows you for to add an extra feature on some remote controls, uh, remote controlled cars. It makes them go faster. On others, it allows you to fire a, a missile or something like that, or maybe play a sound. But on cars that only do four back, left, and right, it's completely unused. It's actually not connected to anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to take certain components to get from Radio Shack, um, chief being a, I don't know if you pronounce it, TIP or TIP120 transistor, and a diode, and also a one kilo ohm resistor, along with a button, uh, which we're going to add to the remote control car, which will activate that unused pin and cause the signal to come from here to this, the little um, circuit we're going to build using the transistor, uh, the, the diode, and uh, a resistor, and we'll connect our airsoft gun to the battery um, remotely. Okay, so I've had people ask me, how do I know if I can use my remote control car for this? I don't have a new bright car. Or uh, how do I know which pins to connect to on the, on the main chip? Well, um, the main thing is you're going to have to use a multimeter. And if you don't know how to use one, you're really doing yourself a disservice. I suggest taking the time to get to learn how to use one. Basically, what I'm going to be doing is I've already got one probe of the multimeter uh, connected to a ground connection here, the negative terminal of the battery. I've got my positive one, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this on camera, not really, um, but I've got the car turned on, and with the remote control, I'm going to press forward, and we're going to test each of these pins for voltage, and whenever I'm pressing forward, if I get a voltage from one of those, that's the pin that corresponds to the forward direction. And then same for backwards, same for left, same for right. And then the final thing is going to be turbo, which that's going to correspond to an unused pin on the remote control, which when I connect that to ground on the remote control, it's going to cause one of these to have a voltage. Um, Usually just something real little, like 3 volts or something like that. Um, and that's the one we're going to be using for our turbo function, and which will connect to our little circuit that we're going to build using that transistor, the diode, and the resistor. So uh, I'm going to map each of these out, find out which pins correspond to which. I suggest looking online, finding a schematic, a pinout for the TX2 RX2 chipset. You can find those with a quick Google search. And uh, I guarantee you, most cars are gonna be very similar. It may not be the exact same pins, but it's gonna be awfully close. Maybe you'll have some that are switched. I know the new bright, um, the um, forward and back, left and right, are opposite of what the um, standard pinout is. So do some research. Also, um, check for yourself, and I think you'll, you'll be able to hack this pretty quick. Okay, well, what do you know? This does match the last time I did this project for a new bright car. It looks like the backwards, I'm getting about 2.7 to 3 volts on pin 11. Forwards, looking at pin 10. Right, it's going to be pin 7, and left, it's going to be pin 6. Now, if you're not sure um, what is which pin is which, how to number them, let me draw you a little schematic and make things it'll make a lot more sense here in just a moment. Let me grab a pen. All right, so when you're looking at an integrated circuit, 
you're going to see on one end it's going to be a little divot like this or sometimes you also see if you don't see a little divot you might see a little dot like that so as you're looking at this that make this your top or the right hand side if you want to starting right here this is going to be pin number one on down one two three four five six seven eight in this case so one through eight and then on over here is going to be pin nine work your way on up 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That's pin 16, okay? Do you see how that follows? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, on up through 16. On, on this particular car that I'm using, it's got 16 pins. So when I say pin 11, I'm talking about 9, 10, 11. This pin right here is going to be my backwards direction, okay? Um, now I'm going to open up the remote control and we're going to find where that turbo pin is. Okay, I've got the remote control open and as you can tell there's really not much going on inside of here. The uh, joysticks <laughs> are actually just plastic pieces sitting on top of a couple of buttons that click left and right or forward and back. Um, you can see here here is the transmission chip, and again, it's it's just like the other one. Um, and you can find a schematic online. Just do a search on Google for pinout for RX2 slash TX2 or TX2 slash RX2. I've gotten results for both, and uh, you'll be able to find quite a bit. But basically, the way this works is um, whenever let's see, get this line up here. Whenever we press down on one of these buttons. It makes a connection between the, that corresponding pin on the chip and ground, the negative um, terminal on the battery. That's an easy way of looking at it. And when it makes that connection between um, that pin on the chip and ground on the battery is when that this chip will send a signal over the antenna to the remote control car saying, hey, this button's been pressed. Now that unused pin for turbo, we're basically going to add in a button that is just going to make, an action, make a connection between that pin on the transmission chip and ground, and that's how we send our signal to the remote control car that, hey, we want the, the turbo function. In this case, it's going to be fire the airsoft gun. Okay, so once again, using the multimeter, I'm going to, and also just looking up the traces on the circuit board here, I'm going to find out which pin correspond, corresponds to which direction, forward, back, left, right, and then I'm going to find that last one that is going to act, give me three volts on the receiving chip on the remote control car, and that's going to be my turbo, okay? Okay, so yeah, just like I thought, it's the same as the last time I hacked up a new bright car. The turbo pin on the car itself is going to be pin number 12. And then the pin on the remote control to connect to ground is pin number six on the remote control. So we're going to wire this up. We'll take a look at what I did and then we'll test it out. I'm going to go ahead and wire up my button here. Pretty straightforward. To make soldering easier, it's best to use something like a soldering paste or what's also known as flux. Um, most uh, solder that you get now also has a rosin core to it, so that helps but I find just adding on a touch of this soldering paste flux type stuff. Go ahead and tin your soldering iron tip a little bit with the solder there and then just lightly tap it onto there. So that kind of prepares the surface. You might do the same with, with this here is to add on just a little bit of that flux. Go ahead and tin it with a little bit of solder. Connect these up. Okay, good and connected. Now, we're going to do, we're going to play a little game called Do What I Say and Not What I Do. Now, in order to drill a hole in the front of this controller for our button, you should use a drill. However, I left mine at work the other day. So, uh, 
if you're in a pinch, you can use a soldering iron, a hot one, to cut a hole through plastic. The uh, thing is, it produces quite a bit of fumes, so don't do this, but it does work. So we're actually just going to stab right on through, and then kind of work our way in concentric circles, round and round till we get the diameter that we need. And you can see it's already putting off quite a bit of smoke and fumes and junk. And this is probably going to give me cancer, but we're just going to move right along here. So remember kids, don't do this ever, ever, because of fumes. But if you gotta, then it does, it does work. So I'm going to let that cool down. Now I'm going to use my X-Acto knife to cut off the extra little bits of plastic that are around there. I'm going to put my trigger button in place and then secure it with the little um, locking nut that comes with it if I can find where I put that. Okay I got my hole all cut. I'm going to now insert the button. Look at that. All right. It's a good fit and then we'll lock it in place using this thing. Okay, finger tight is good enough. Now what we're going to do is flatten out these leads a bit so that it won't get caught on anything. And now we will connect this end of the wires to... One of them is going to go to pin... Let's see here, pin number six on the remote control and the other one's going to connect to ground or the negative battery terminal. It's usually the easiest way. Then we'll put the uh, controller back together and we've made our turbo button. Here is the circuit that we're going to be building for this project. It's really pretty straightforward and only consists of just a very few components. Right here is our receiving chip on the car and connected to pin number 12 is a one kilo ohm resistor. That's this. That's um, brown black, red, if you're looking at the stripes, or you can measure that with a multimeter. That connects to the base of the transistor. Connected to the collector of the transistor, the middle pin in this case, is going to be our diode. Notice the direction that your stripe on the diode is going to be facing. It's going to be towards the collector with the other end pointing towards ground. The emitter is going to be connected to ground. The negative terminal, the black lead on our airsoft gun, is going to be connected to the collector of the transistor before the diode. The positive terminal is going to connect to the positive terminal of the battery, and then, of course, battery um, negative terminal connected to ground. So let's build this on breadboard just so you can see what we're looking at. Let's jam that on in there. And okay, so we've got our resistor, which is connected to the base of our transistor. All right, so something like that. You can see how I've got it plugged into the base of the transistor and then off to the side on the next row. Our diode. Notice that we've got ground here and ground here, and we've got our diode. So what we can do is actually kind of a shortcut here. Um, don't know if you can see the gray stripe on this end of the diode. We're going to put that right here towards the middle pin of our transistor. And then on the next row over, we're going to put the other lead of the, of the diode right there. So do you see how one lead is in the middle? And then the, the other end, which is pointing towards ground, is on the same column here on the breadboard as our emitter of the transistor. So we can just connect ground right here and then the black lead on the airsoft gun we're going to connect to, I can either just clip onto this tab right here which is connected to our collector or I can clip onto this lead of the diode right there. Um, and then pin number 12 from our RC car is going to uh, go right here on this resistor. So pretty straightforward. I'm going to go ahead and commit this to bread. I mean, commit this to perf board because 
I know that this circuit works. We'll wire it up and we'll test and then we'll put it all together. Keeping our diagram handy while we're soldering really helps stay organized. Okay, so I've got really just a tiny little bit of perf board here. And again, using my flux and a handy toothpick, we're going to uh, apply some of that to the copper pads that we'll need to solder to just to help make things easier. Uh, I'm going to just stick my transistor there on one edge and then we're going to solder that down into place just to help keep it stay put there. And you can use as much or as little flux as you want to, but I tend to use a little bit much just because it makes life so much easier. There we go. And inspector work, make sure we don't have any thing that's jumped. Okay, next we're going to connect our resistor. And I am just going to line it up just like that. Push it on through. Nothing fancy here. And we can even bend this lead up, solder it to there, and then snip off the extra. We've got a connection just like that. Now with this diode, I'm actually, <clears throat> see I'm kind of angling this just a touch because we're going to connect one end to the collector, the other end's going to connect to the emitter of this transistor. So turning this back over, this top portion, we're going to bend upwards and we can add a touch of flux onto that. And again, yes, I'm probably overdoing it with the flux, but whatever. This makes it a lot easier. Don't want a cold solder joint. That's when it looks like it's connected, but it's not actually. And that will give you no end of complications. Cold solder joints. All right, and now looks like that other end of our diode we're going to connect to the emitter. So I can just bend this up again. See how easy this is when you've got extra long leads on everything? You don't snip anything prematurely, you put it through. A little bit of foresight. And you can... It's kind of a halfway in between doing things on a perf board and doing the dead bug approach to electronics, which if you haven't heard of the dead bug approach to electronics, then basically kind of freestyle everything without a board and just connect the components to each other directly. And when it's all finished, it looks like a dead bug with its lying on its back with its legs sticking up in the air. Okay, snipping off these extra leads, checking to make sure we don't have any cold solder joints or anything jumping where it shouldn't be. All right, we're ready to go ahead and hot glue this into place in the car and make our connections. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, you can see here I already have two wires connected. This one right here connects to the negative terminal of our batteries. It's actually connected to the power switch for the car, which connects and disconnects the negative battery terminal. I have that wire snaking through a hole here and sticking out underneath the board. I also have a wire connected to pin number 12 on our receiving chip. Again, that's snaking through a little hole here and then sticking out on this end. I'm going to secure our little board with the transistor right here so it's down and out of the way and I can easily cover it with some electrical tape at a later point in time. But let's refer back to our schematic, find out what we're connecting and where. Looks like I need to connect pin number 12 to where that resistor goes. So that's this wire here connecting to this resistor. How about I go ahead and feed this bit of my wire through the board just so it will look nicer. Okay, and now our negative 
connection is going to, we can either connect it directly to E, we could connect it to the end of the diode, just whichever is easiest. Okay, got those connections to the car in place. And the next two things that we will need is actually the, the black lead, the negative lead from our airsoft gun is going to connect to uh, where that stripe is on the diode. And then the positive lead, the red wire on the airsoft gun is going to, going to connect to the positive um, connection for our battery, which there's a spot right here, or I could even go right where the battery terminal is right here. And then the negative lead of the battery is uh, already connected. You can see here where I've um, added a battery connector, an RC car battery connector, to the two leads where the battery ordinarily goes. The original battery clips on the underside of the vehicle. Uh, instead, I'm actually going to be using the much larger battery pack that I bought on clearance and basically have it sitting on the side rails or something like that. Uh, in order to give us some extra speed for the car because the car is originally 6 volts and this will be 7.2 volts. It will give us extra capacity. Um, capacity on this is 2,000 milliamp hours or 2 amp hours if you've seen that um, as opposed to whatever the heck this little dinky thing is probably well no it doesn't even say what capacity it, it is so who knows maybe I could crack this open and see if there's any writing on there but it's really not too much. Okay, so using our hot glue gun, we can go ahead and secure this board in place. Now, one rule of thumb with hot glue is the moment you use it, you're going to realize that you've messed up on something and you're going to have to instantly undo what you just did. That's always the case for me with hot glue. And in fact, this is the second time on this project that I've secured this board into place using hot glue. The first time, I don't know what was happening, maybe, maybe I had a short somewhere, but the moment I connected the battery, the gun would just start shooting crazily on its own and uh, <laughs> we completely disregard this circuit. I don't know what happened, so taking the pieces apart, putting them onto breadboard, and then testing again, and then it worked. So, um, so always test your circuit first on breadboard, then commit it to perf board and, and go from there. Uh, I was just so dead sure that I wasn't going to have any issues uh, because, because I've done the circuit before with the Nerf gun car, but you never know. It's always an issue. And of course, I had used hot glue and I had to tear all this up. And I'm using high temperature hot glue, which is even harder to lift. So typical figures. All right, now let's go ahead and test the circuit. I'm going to grab my gun here, and here coming out the bottom, we've got the positive and negative leads of the airsoft gun. The positive lead is going to connect to the battery power for the car. And I'm just for fun, I'm going to clip it right here on the positive lead of the battery terminal. The negative, remember, from our circuit, the negative lead of the motor is going to connect to the collector of our transistor right in front of that diode. Okay, That's the whole point of using the transistor is it's going to be our little switch, on and off switch, of connecting the airsoft gun to... Yeah, connecting the, our airsoft gun to the um, battery. So... Let's see, let's get creative on clipping this into place here. <laughs> um, I'm going to clip it onto the tab of the transistor. I don't know if you can see this in this video, but the collector on this, on this transistor, the schematic on the back of the packaging from Radio Shack is telling me that the tab is actually connected to that middle section, the, the collector. So, okay, we're going to connect the battery, and then we're going to demonstrate this thing making all sorts of noise when I press the button on the remote control. And if everything goes according to plan, it's not going to go haywire on me again this time. Let's just nestle that into place there. I'm going to reach underneath the car to get to that power switch. Okay, car is turned on. And now we've got our remote control. When I press this button, we should have a loud noise. Success! All right. <laughs> 
Okay, now we get to put everything together and actually permanently connect the wire of the car to the airsoft gun and we'll take it outside for a test. I just realized that in order to make this project a lot easier I'm going to have to extend the leads from the airsoft gun and also I get to play with a little bit of heat shrink. If you have never played with heat shrink it's almost worth it almost worth learning electronics just so you can play with this stuff. Basically it's a piece of plastic tubing that you put over the connection between two wires and then you heat it with a flame or some heat source like a heat gun and it will it does exactly what it sounds. It's heat shrink. It shrinks with the heat and it is better than electrical tape because there's less of a chance of it sliding away on you. So I'm going to go ahead and make a connection here. Something you might consider getting is something called Helping Hands, which looks just like this. It's got a couple little clips and you can hold two wires together while you're soldering them. I'm not going to do that because um, I'm just trying to do this quick and nerdy, you know. One thing with heat shrink, it's usually a good idea to slip it onto the wire before you make your connection between components, but fortunately the other end of these wires are loose, so let's see, I'm going to add a bit more solder to that connection. Just to get a good tight bond on there. All right, now I'm going to take my bit of heat shrink, slide it on over, and slip it right over that connection between the two wires. I'll do the same with the other piece. Now it just takes a light touch with the heat. Don't blast it because you'll melt your wires, but um, you can get this at any hardware store, really. There's a kit, a heat shrink kit that you can get. Uh, I've got two or three little miniature blow torches like this. Uh, it's basically a butane cigarette lighter inside of a fancy holder. So, all right, got a flame going. And we just apply a little bit of heat there. And as we apply that, it shrinks up. You can then kind of lift this and get at the other, other angle there. Again, don't overdo it, but you do want enough that it shrinks up that it will hold in place. This is really handy if you've got a resistor or a capacitor, especially capacitor leads. If you're really worried about them touching something they shouldn't and exploding on you, heat shrink's a very good way of preventing one leg from touching the other or something to that effect. And it since it shrinks and contours to the shape of everything, there's very little chance that that's going to slip off if you uh, secure it correctly. Okay, I've got my new longer leads attached there. I'm ready to attach the airsoft gun to the car. The RC car itself has a plastic cover that is going to go over the circuit board. Remember we took that off this little piece of plastic. Uh, I may need to snip some of this plastic so that the battery leads can come out and also connections to the RC car uh, can fit on through. Also, not forgetting to snake my antenna wire up through this little hole. Okay, let me figure that out and we'll see what it looks like when I've got the car attached to the airsoft gun. Okay, here is the finished project. I've actually got it all uh, taped on there with electrical tape and the battery is attached and checking the functions left and right for backwards and forwards and of course we always want to press the big red button now we get to take it outside and test shoot at me a bit alright and then he comes in
Fire! Hold on a second.